Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Claire Adamson. I'm MSP for Motherwell Militia and convener of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee of the Scottish Parliament. So uh, I would like to welcome you to the 24, 2024 Festival of Politics. Um, this marks the 20th year of the Festival of Politics taking place uh, in provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages in every walk of life and encouraging you to engage with the Parliament. Um, and there will be a chance to ask questions of our panel uh, towards the end of today's session. Um, but I'm looking forward to the discussion and hearing everyone's thoughts and views. We're delighted that we can be joined today to participate in global politics in 2024, tw testing times ahead, in partnership with the Council on Scottish Council on Global Affairs. And later, I'll be inviting you to get involved with the questions. You can also throw your own thoughts or, or make any comments using the at Visit Scott Parl on Twitter, I won't say X, uh, and Instagram at Scott Parl. Um, so please um, be active and, and, and take part as you wish. I'm pleased to be joined here today by Professor Peter Jackson, Jason Boxed, and Professor. Michelle Burgess Castilla. Peter Jackson is a chair in global security, global affairs at the University of Glasgow and has taught many international UK and American in many UK and American universities and is chair of the Scottish Council on Global Affairs. Jason Box is a partner at RXN Group in Washington, DC. He's worked in public affairs and opinion research for more than 20 years with expertise in many areas, including reputation and brand management, campaign and message, development and political strategy. And Michelle burgess Castala is the Professor of International Law and Global Governance at the University of Edinburgh. And prior to Edinburgh, she also taught in the School of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. So, we're just going to have um, a discussion with the panel and as I said there will be an opportunity, there will be roving microphones for people to um, ask questions later on if you just let yourself known at the appropriate time. Um, but I'll begin by just asking our, our panel just what what's your summation of 2024 in terms of geopolitics so far and what are the key areas of the world that we need to be closest scrutiny of at the moment and I'll start with Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Claire, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks for the invitation. I always uh, take up the invitation to come to the Festival of Politics uh, because it's such a brilliant affair, and this is an amazing crowd. So thank you all for coming along. And it's particularly great to see a mix of generations. Uh, so I'm hoping we'll have uh, an informative and fun discussion. Sometimes they can be lively, and that's great. But... Uh, for me, at least, I'm uh, more of an expert in turn, and I'm more of a generalist and, in fact, an historian by training. And so I think I'd like to begin by taking an historical view just very briefly about the course of international politics since the end of the Cold War. Because I think at the end of the Cold War saw the emergence of a, a liberal, democratic uh, international order, a liberal democratic capitalist international order that was predominant in the 1990s and the first decade of the, the 21st century, uh, our 20th, 21st century rather, and I think also reflected, I suppose, the side that won the Cold War, uh, the kind of Western alliance of liberal democracies and in many ways they were able to impose their vision and their I suppose general framework for how the international order should work and it emphasized international law it emphasized uh, uh, national sovereignty more or less and uh, I suppose it's it was very distinct from the Cold War order in that there wasn't a major challenge. And then during the first decade of the 21st century, those same uh, kind of 
if you like, liberal democratic, mainly Western powers that managed to write the rules and also what in, in international relations are called norms, and that is expectations that give uh, a world order a level of predictability and stability so that there's, you know, there, it's, you know, states don't tend to behave in erratic ways and violate the written and unwritten rules of the order. But then those same nations did quite a lot to undermine the legitimacy of that order when they intervened and started nation building in the name of democracy promotion and human rights in Afghanistan and especially in Iraq. And the idea that, you know, international law and national sovereignty was inviolable uh, was, was given a pretty stiff body blow by the way in which the coalition of states that invaded Iraq in particular ignored the United Nations and the Security Council and uh, went ahead after a failed attempt to kind of uh, get their way. And I think we've been dealing with the reper repercussions of that ever since. And we've seen the rise of states, new states, reflecting in a lot of ways the changing dynamics of the kind of global economy that, have, that are very, very clear in their intent to challenge this kind of rules-based international order that emerged after 1990. And uh, while they accept a kind of a world order based on capitalism most of the time, there is a surge, a powerful global surge of nationalist populism that is a real threat not only to that order, and many of us, and it depends on which day I get out of bed, think that that order is already in tatters, it's already disintegrating. In any case, uh, you know, there is a challenge to, I suppose, that kind of liberal democracy that we have come to hold dear, in which, in many ways, the Second World War, and uh, uh, for what the, the reasons to wage Cold War were all about, this idea of, you know, representative democracy and, and individual rights and some of the things that go with it are now under real threat, even at the heart of the Western coalition that imposed that order, and that is the United States. We also see a real challenge in, in, in Russia, which has embarked on a campaign to kind of take international politics back to the 19th century and empire building and spheres of influence and strategic buffers through its illegal and unprovoked uh, invasion of Ukraine. But also China and India, who are rising powers, who profess to to adhere to different kind of ideological principles than, than, I suppose, inspired many of that, many states within that Western-led coalition. I think I've spoken too long, Claire, now, <laughs> so I'll pass the torch on. But that's the wider, I think, kind of historical perspective within which we could tr seek to understand what on earth is going on today. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Jason, would you like to... There's nothing left to say. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's, it's, I'm not sure what's more daunting, trying to talk about uh, a year in which three billion people are voting or speaking on a panel between two professors. Uh, uh, so there's the, there's the study of international um, uh, affairs, and then there's the practice of international affairs, and then there's the politics of international affairs. So I'm the political hack on the panel, so I can, it's easier for me to focus on the, on the politics of it. Um, one of the points that uh, Peter just made, and we were talking a little bit about, uh, so the, the rise of nationalism, and you know, how do you talk about however many, 50 elections so far? I mean, it's just some massive number. But for me, it all kind of ties back to uh, this post-COVID uh, low economy. And you know, so James Carville is a, I guess he's a well-known American political consultant, kind of a redneck like me. Um, 
And he always just boiled it down to this very simple phrase, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, and so the lens that I kind of look at what's happening in the world and all the, the, the politics and elections that are happening, uh, for me it all boils back down to the economy uh, and how people feel about uh, how far their, their dollar or pound or yen or whatever, how far that goes. Uh, certainly in, in our election in the U.S., uh, it's about the economy. Um, uh, it's it, it's not about Trump. Uh, it is about Trump, but it's really about the economy. Um, I think they're in day three now of the Democratic National Convention. I don't think they've really talked about foreign policy at, at all. Uh, I think you have to go back to 2004 before you had an election in the United States, at least, where foreign policy had any kind of impact. Um, I think Americans, uh, though I think we are not totally... Um, uh, without reason ridiculed for our lack of sort of global vision and the fact that none of us travel. But I think most people uh, tend to put foreign policy and, uh, and other people's elections last, kind of in the, in the pecking order of how they consider their own election. Um, uh, and we'll probably talk more about sort of how America uh, views uh, foreign affairs. But uh, I, I, it all boils down to the economy for me. Michelle, would you like? Yeah, so just picking up on some of these points, I totally agree with Peter that I, uh, in that sort of post-1989 moment, the world felt expansive, anything was possible, new forms of multilateralism. And as an international lawyer, it was, it was seen as a wonderful moment to reinvigorate these sort of nascent um, norms and institutions. Um, but I think now, if I look at the future, my key concern is constraints on resources. So if we think about the economy, we can no longer, all norms or institutions, they all, they all are within this constraint of, 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 car of carbon, basically, um, and, and our sort of role in how we navigate any future based on that, and the fact that the implications for um, the, the, the carbon capitalist model will, will really detrimentally affect people in very unequal ways. And we see that play, playing out in, in our politics at, at every level, the local to the global. Um, and whether or not that's factored into policy, it's, I, I feel like it's always the shadow in the background. So, so where once before capitalist, capitalism had this notion of sort of ever expansion, you know, sort of like taking over this 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 area of the commons or the sea or, or space, I feel now that our politics feels constrained and limited. And I think that in, in some ways also then makes it harder to be more utopian in our, in our imagination and our visions, actually, because we're in this closed room. Um, the room is actually very small, and in some ways it's getting smaller and we have more people in it. So I think then there's a real challenge to work within those constraints together um, and often the, the, the sort of response is to actually, yeah, become quite tribal, as we've heard with these um, populist and nationalist uh, movements, and to sort of really double down on our resources, you know. Um, and I think that's going to be um, the big challenge. I myself um, work on the Middle East, so for me this has been a cataclysmically horrific year, and um, as an international lawyer, many of us sort of question whether there are any international laws left at this point. So um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, we've got questions around democracy, around institutions, and, and the extent to which uh, international law actually matters at all anymore, because I, I don't actually, there are days when I don't believe in it at all anymore. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sobering thoughts from all, I think. Um, Michelle, um, in, in terms of the inequality, um, and we talked about capitalism, and, and one thing that we have seen is that the, the super rich are getting richer and richer and richer, and the challenges are always on, on um, the, the people least able to cope with um, economic challenges, if you like, and also the the climate injustice and the global south and, and the impact that um, our policies and foreign policies of the, the past in terms of industrialisation are having in those areas. So how, how much do you think um, that pressure is going to come to to the north and the west, if you like, um, that has pretty much been um, not challenged by that up until now? Well, I, I think we'd all agree it's, it's going to be more present by the moment. I mean, some people would say that even the Syrian 
civil war um, that erupted in 2010 was partly driven by, by climate breakdown. We can see that even conflicts in Sudan now, Yemen, they're all partly being driven by climate breakdown. Um, and these then have regional but also global effects in terms of the massive movement of people. And then, then I mean, the Syrian conflict, for example, then reignited conflict in Iraq and then in, and, and sort of reignited things in, in Lebanon. So we can just see the spillover effect, the contagion effect um, can't be can't be, you know, um, contained uh, to, to one single state. So um, I think that's the most immediate effect, um, but longer term as well, just in terms of resources, um, more extreme forms of politics, I think, will, will play out. Yeah, and at one point, the rich will also um, feel it most acutely, I think, in terms of their own resources. Yeah. And, and Jason, um, we talked about how global politics did have much of a an impact on the, the, the decision of voters in the US. Uh, it, it, is climate change part of what's been discussed or is it in the same as global politics? And, no, and uh, 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 it's a great question. Uh, I think actually it is being felt in the US, but we, I don't think most US voters recognize it as uh, a global problem. They recognize it as a border problem. Uh, and so, I mean, obviously the, the global south, the climate issues, wrecks their economy, they go somewhere else. And uh, in our case, and I know you have immigration problems in the UK as well, uh, in the US, uh, you know, climate's not an issue on the, on the table really, um, which I find encouraging because I think actually both parties are moving more toward a general acknowledgement that climate change is real. It's really only the extremes now that, that uh, will say that out loud. But we're feeling it in terms of our, of our own election. Immigration is a huge issue. Um, uh, so we do feel it, uh, you know, our, yeah, I mean, we, the, the rich will eventually have to deal with this problem. Um, and politically, we're dealing with it now, for sure. I mean, you know, immigration, as long as, as long as climate is a factor in the global south, immigration will be a political issue uh, for the rest of the world. Yeah. Okay. Any thoughts, Peter? On uh, well, I have lots of thoughts, but... <laughs> Uh, it's been put very well so far. I suppose I would say two things. The first is, you know, the, the effects of the of the degradation of our of of the our climate are. If if you t the scales fall from your eyes, they seem self evident. But I come from a Western Canada, Alberta, which has been an oil economy for more than a century and is the hotbed of climate skepticism in Canada. And half the province has been on fire all summer. And still, you know, and I'm still in contact with many of my school friends, and there's still uh, a strange reluctance to kind of put what I would say would be two and two together. And I don't know what the answer is in terms of convincing people that you know that 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 this is real, but it's a very important, it's a very important campaign. Politically, I agree with Jason that you know, climate did not change denial is on the fringes, but then there's a spectrum of opinion about what can be done and what can't be done that I, it worries me, and it does create huge migratory pressures, which in turn and have always radicalized politics. Waves of migrants have always radicalized politics in Western Europe, and we're seeing it in, in North America as well. And to deny this is to deny, deny historical experience. I don't agree with it. I reject it. And in most of its forms, I find it quite abhorrent. And I, I'm an immigrant myself. I'm a migrant. So uh, uh, they're just really, really difficult dilemmas. But the first step towards dealing with them is to acknowledge them. Can, can, yes, sure. I, if I could just be an optimist for a second, I feel like we need to lift the room a little bit. Uh, I, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic uh, to that last point you made. I, I think there are solutions that are right around the corner. Um, I, I firmly believe that the technology exists and will continue to develop in a way that will allow us to answer all of these questions, again, I don't think climate is the direct issue. It's increasingly an indirect issue. It's a cause of a lot of issues that we're dealing with, whether it's transportation policy or energy policy or immigration policy. Um, I, I, I want to believe, I, I think I believe, uh, 
that will find solutions. Uh, that uh, That's just sort of what the human condition is, is to be confronted with a problem and find solutions. And while the impacts are, are awful and, and you know, and are at our doorstep, if not in our front yard, uh, I still believe that we will find solutions to these. We, maybe it's not solutions, maybe it's mitigation in a lot of cases, uh, but we will find responses that, uh, that positively uh, affect the problems that we're being encountered with uh, politically. Yeah. I, I guess, I mean, you mentioned um, coronavirus but um, and lockdown, but we did see technology coming together in terms of the, the scientific community coming together to, to find solutions in terms of vaccines for that. So um, I suppose it is possible, right? hopeful as well, that um, some of these issues might cause a galvanisation of, of that thought at some point. Um, I, I personally, I used to be uh, working in IT and I chair the cross-party group in science and technology, so I'm interested in some of the um, scientific challenges that we face. So AI is, is an issue that um, we're all having to deal with in terms of misinformation and in what we're seeing. It's obvious misuse, um, but obviously the potentials as well. And I just, just wondered about what um, impact AI is having on... Um, global politics and global relations in terms of where we're going with that. And uh, uh, Peter, would you like to come in first on that? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm by no means an expert, but uh, what we have seen and what we, can, we will continue to see is, uh, and quite often state-based, state-sponsored uh, international actors that interfere in the politics and especially the elections of other states. And Artificial intelligence has just made it easier to create skepticism and doubts about what constitutes reality. And that, to me, is very worrying. And we've seen it already. We've seen uh, Donald Trump's uh, both Twitter X account and uh, his Truth Social account tweeting deep fake photos and calling into question obvious things like, you know, the crowd at Kamala Harris political rally. And it just creates that extra element of doubt, which demoralizes in some ways people and makes people think that they can't trust anything. And the, the levels of, of mistrust in politics and politician are one of the most concerning things to me. Michelle, uh, two things. One is what, how I've used AI in the classroom, if I can, because um, I'm not an expert at all. But I, I thought, well, we need to learn how to use this stuff. There's no point being scared of it. We actually have to get in and just get our hands messy. And so what I got my students to do was to watch a YouTube video of how to use ChatGPT. We'd read a specific European Court of Human Rights case um, beforehand in class. Um, and it's a feminist class. It's on women's um, human rights. And um, we asked ChatGPT to um, provide a feminist judgment of the European Court decision. So basically we asked the AI to rewrite the judgment in a particular way. But that required the students to actually pro put the prompts in themselves to work out what they would have to ask of ChatGPT. And then their assignment was to write up their own reflection on the biases inherent in the AI mod, um, judgment. Um, because, and this, I thought, was great because they had to engage with, with the material. They had to think um, sort of quite critically about which prompts to use. And then they had to sort of th think about, well, this is not a neutral or objective judgment, as is the case with any judgment. Every judgment has its particular positionality. Um, and and uh, the students, I think, anyway, got quite a lot out of the, the assignment by, by seeing all the different ways in which they could have generated slightly different judgments. So even AI itself um, can be used in so many different ways. So um, I think we're going to have to be doing more and more of this. I don't think we should say, oh, my God, you know, it's going to make people like robots and they won't think. In fact, some of the responses I had from my students were just absolutely amazing in terms of critical thinking. Like, I cannot think of a better assignment in terms of testing their own critical thinking. So, the, so the, the thought that, oh, AI is going to make us not think, at least for that assignment, was the very opposite. I was really shocked by some of the answers I got, pleasantly surprised. So that was my, my sort of personal encounter with AI, which was really positive. 
the horrifically negative one that I've been reading more about is in relation to Gaza um, and Israel's use of it. And if we're thinking about AI and its evil effects, I'm sorry, but that's what's happening right now in Gaza. Um, and there have been amazing reports that have come out from investigative journalists around particular software that's being developed. Um, and I won't bore you with the details, but the long and the short of it is that the capabilities that now are um, available particularly to states in terms of the sheer amount of data that can be crunched. In the past, for example, the Israeli army would just have to delete stuff like any army. They couldn't store it. But now AI can simply go through every single name, every single build, you know, room in a building, and then work out where, where people are. But the, the sort of the dark side of it was that with this particular Mind72 report, I can direct anyone if they want to it, um, the the really disturbing name of this software is Where's Daddy? Because it was basically to try to differentiate male and female voices and persons within Gaza and then to work out when Daddy was home, which was usually in the nighttime, so any Daddy who was potentially a Hamas operative, and then the particular bomb would be sent to Daddy when he was at home because that would be the best time to to target him, and that's part of the reason why we've actually had such a disproportionate number of <coughs> women and children as casualties. So even though international humanitarian law requires that ultimately you should only try to be targeting you know, people directly part of conflict, the, the, the sort of the dark irony of this <laughs> AI program was to actually mean that often a hit to one potential operative resulted in 10 other death. So, so I'm just trying to sort of show that even with these capabilities, which supposedly make targeting more sophisticated um, and surely more precise, the result, at least in, in what's happened in, in the last almost year in Gaza, has actually to, to increase the casualties um, of, even in Israel's eyes, civilian um, women and children. So, so this comes back to the point that we always have the possibility of using AI critically. I don't think we should say, oh, it's to the experts, it's to the scientists. No, 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 we're all implicated in it. We all have to get our hands messy. And I think the, the uses of it can be wonderful, potentially in terms of climate options, but it also can be really horrifically dark. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Jason? Such a cheerful <laughs> Um <laughs> Uh, I, I, so I think AI is as good or as bad as what people decide to use it for. Um, I think it, it, AI is different from chat B, GPT. Uh, I, I will say uh, quite earnestly, I used chat GPT to prepare for this panel. Uh, because there's just too much information for one human to aggregate and to try to synthesize. Um, but to the point about being a, a critical user of it, um, and you a lot of students in the room, uh, chat GPT, and we can call it AI, but I think that's, uh, large language models are different from AI. Uh, I think actually most of us don't see AI. We are simply um, kind of in the world in which it operates. But chat GPT is actually something that we can and I think should use. Um, it's a great organizational tool, uh, particularly if you're a student and you've got to consume the universe of data that this generation has access to that my generation couldn't have possibly imagined. You know, I used phone books. You know what a phone book is? You know what a phone is? Uh, uh, and the fact that you have all this, and we talk about this generation, uh, and every subsequent generation has so much ac access to information. Um, but that, to me, doesn't necessarily make you more empowered. I actually think it can be um, paralyzing when you have that much information. And how do you discern? Uh, what's what's true and what's not. We get into sort of data literacy, and if you're coming to any of my other sessions uh, for the remainder of the week, I apologize. You're going to hear this a lot. Um, we are uh, we we don't we are not as humans digitally literate. I think every new generation is increasingly more digitally literate. Uh, how do you use the tools? Um, we are devastatingly uh, data <laughs> illiterate, uh, information illiterate. Uh, most people don't have. The, the context or capacity to, uh, to often tell the difference between uh, information that's right, information that's wrong. Um, we talk about mis and disinformation. Misinformation is just false stuff, fake news, call it what you want. Disinformation is that very intentional, uh, I'm going to mislead you. But there is a 
uh, a sea in between uh, misinformation and disinformation, which is misleading information uh, that people with uh, not uh, a malignant intent will take information that looks accurate and often is. Uh, there's a, a, an article, the, the Washington Post put an, uh, an article with the headline that uh, more, um, co uh, more COVID deaths now are among those who are vaccinated. But there's a whole context to that. I mean, you know, most of the unvaccinated people had died at that point. So it was, it was natural that, and then that it was going to move on to us. Um, but but uh, vaccine deniers, anti-vaxxers were taking that Washington Post headline and they were using it to actually mislead people, uh, which isn't quite disinformation because it's actual information, but it's being just used nefariously. Um, I'm going on and on. Uh, I, I, I think that... Um, Technology is. I used to be a technophobe. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm. I'm a technophyte. Like, I, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I. I believe that, even in the cases that you mentioned, uh, and like Gaza is a whole another panel, right? Um, but uh, there will always be bad actors, uh, and it's incumbent upon those of us who are not, you know, those of us who are not bad actors, to be critical and to think about what we pass on and not just to pass it on mindlessly and assuming that it's right or wrong, that we actually have to apply critical thought to uh, however we synthesize the information that we have at our disposal. I guess the, the, the whole thing about chat GPT is it's looking at everything that's on the internet, but it can't see if it's correct or not. So bad actors, I'll tell you about bad actors. My son's friends at school used to regularly update my Wikipedia page to wind them up. <laughs> Something I didn't set up, and uh, he was 27 last week, and he was presented with a T-shirt with his mom's Wikipedia page on it. So don't, don't be a politician. <laughs> Not if you don't want to upset your kids. So, um, But the bad actors thing is really important, but, but there is a whole load of rubbish out there, and it can't determine what's right and what's wrong. And I think that's the big danger of the urban myth eventually being embedded so much in so many places on the internet that it becomes difficult to ter determine what's real, what's not, what's truth and what's not. So, um, uh, yeah, big, big challenges ahead. Um, so there is regulation around um, AI um, proposed by the European Union and Rishi Sunak was involved in a summit about it before, but... Um, do you think regulation in global sense, in global politics, regulation can be achieved in these areas? And I'm thinking about how we've, the World Wide Web starting at CERN has been a way of sharing information. And now, you know, as um, my colleague who's doing the games workshop later on today uh, on Scottish Games Industry would say it's full of cat toys and porn, basically, for the World Wide Web, 90% of it. So, um, can we regulate any of this? And, and where does where does the UK stand as outside of Europe in terms of these big decisions about regulation of AI and other areas going forward? I have the least to say on the UK, so <laughs> why don't I go first? Uh, I, no is the very short answer to your question. I don't I don't expect many of you follow US policy. Uh, but there's so little that is able to be done at a federal level that the states have taken it upon themselves to try to regulate AI. Um, it's the equivalent of like a grocery store cashier trying to map out economic policy. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, it's the wild, wild west. It's, it's 50 policies uh, and not one, which uh, as I'm sure you're familiar with the EU, there is value to being one market as opposed to 50 for all the reasons, including regulation. Uh, I have zero confidence that AI can be regulated at a global level, but I'm actually quite comfortable with AI being regulated at a local level. Uh, like many things, the people who are around you often know what is best for you. Uh, and so I think uh, it's not terrible that AI is being regulated in the United States at a state level rather than a federal one. Federal will catch up. Uh, but it, it, its actual practical application is, is much more locally felt, I think, than it is uh, uh, certainly countrywide. Yeah. Peter, any thoughts? Well, uh, it's very tricky because kind of national regulations or uh, uh, whatever the UK is at uh, kind of 
amalgamation of nations very difficult to do effectively if you're planning, unless you're planning on restic restricting the ability of your citizens to access information outside. And for me, the, the great tragedy of all of this is that, you know, as Claire said, the, the internet is, was supposed to be about encouraging conversations. And social media was about bringing people together. <laughs> but what the algorithms do is all drive us apart and drive us toward more extreme positions and more extreme understandings. And if you like, you know, kind of sealed hermetic communities of people who agree with each other and who work each other up constantly because uh, if part of human nature is we respond to things that make us angry and we tend to, to click more, we get more motivated to do more clicks. And uh, it's a real tragedy. So for me, anything we can do, and it's, we're with the Scottish Council on Global Affairs, it's one of our core missions is to encourage wider conversations and to get people to have confidence in their own ability to understand global affairs, international politics, and to engage with them. Because I don't think Scotland's as good as it should be at that. Challenge for us, Michelle. <laughs> well, I, I was just reflecting that we're all, you know, Canadian, Amer American, Australian, Scottish. We're all in some ways actually part of federal, if we want to call it very simply systems. And so when you were talking about the local, I mean, I do think that being in a federal system of, of different sorts is a wonderful opportunity to try to sort of keep the conversation going because it is so easy to just, yeah, get, get in your little social media silo. Um, but, you know, I know the Australian system, you know, where it, a compromise is actually politically essential, otherwise nothing would happen. And the same with all of our systems. And obviously, as Scotland, you know, we have to accommodate in various ways the Westminster model. So I think we need to sort of exploit those existing structures that actually force us to, to, to speak with each other, even if very begrudgingly, as we see a lot of the time from our politicians. So, I mean, I think that's one. And so it would actually be quite interesting to sort of look at the politics that is emerging in federal systems compared to non-federal systems. I, I, that's just a thought I had. Um, and the second is we haven't talked about the private sector. So, I mean, who is driving AI? Obviously, I, I'm familiar with what's happening in terms of Israel-Gaza, but then that's, that, that is obviously partly state-based, but it's also privately led. And a lot of these AI initiatives are, are privately led um, in various places around the world. And in terms of global governance trends in general, a lot of the... Um, regulatory sort of norms that are emerging are actually coming often from the private sector themselves that will say, you know, actually we need to have some sort of shared understandings around how we're operating here. Um, often in terms of, say, uh, corporate practice, you know, it's not going to necessarily be, you know, at the level of formal state-based, um, you know, laws or regulations. It will be far more um, amorphous and sort of soft and fluid that may eventually lead to some, you know, treaty, treaty but often it doesn't get to that level. And so I think there's going to be a lot of this as well, a lot of soft regulation by the big private AI actors. And the, the struggle here, I think, is just the time frame. It's so quick, these changes. You know, in the past where we would have had a few decades to sort of catch up, now it's just, it's exponential. Um, and, and, and I think it is going to be quite difficult for the average person to be part of that conversation because, yeah, of this, the speed and, and the resources um, involved. But so I, I see yeah, that being a space. So we need to find ways to bring the public into those private conversations. I, I'm not sure how. Um, but, yeah, that, that would definitely be a big challenge um, for the regulation of AI. Well, a good yeah. start would be yeah. higher data literacy. You yeah. can't yeah, be a part exactly. of the conversation if yeah. you don't actually understand how it all works. Governments yeah. are always going to lag. Yeah. Governments are, a, a by, for, by definition, they are a response to what people feel and then how they behave and then they vote. So governments are always going to be behind. The resources have always been on the private side. Progress is made largely through private endeavor, not necessarily government. I mean, I don't... I don't look to my government to kind of lead the way. I, I, I protect, you know, protect norms and, and, and do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis rights, but uh, I, I fully expect the progress to be made at the private level. Uh, we just need a smarter citizenry. I suppose that, you know, in an individual sense, the data is valuable to an individual, but, um, you know, when you start multiplying it up and up, the data becomes so much more valuable to likes of 
the big players and Facebook and Twitter and things like that. But I've always felt that there was a, a space for an open source, a community-led um, social media space. And I think that might be um, something that will come to the fore that might, might improve the situation where it's not driven by, you know, the money and the, the data and advertising and things. Anyway... I think it's time we give you all a chance to take part. Um, so the staff are going to be um, round the room uh, uh, with roving microphones. Um, if you want to tell us who you are, that's very, very nice. But even just a first name would be nice. Uh, so um, I saw a hand up. The very, very first hand was up at the back there, right beside where you are. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Alex Fawkes. You talked about bad actors. And uh, I'm interested in your view on Elon Musk and X. It's a toxic environment. And this festival of politics and this parliament are still advertising on uh, X. Should we stop doing that? Because this parliament, this event's funded by our taxpayer dollars. So should we stop using X? What do you think? Because uh, it's a toxic environment. And the sooner we stop using it, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Okay? I think that's a really valid point. Um, I, I know many of my colleagues have recently been coming off X. It's something I'm considering doing as well. I guess I'm, I'm waiting for that replacement, something like Mastodon or something else there that might be better um, or an open source option. Um, but, uh, you know, I, th I think we all we all liked Twitter. <laughs> we had a different, different um, product in Twitter. Uh, um, but I guess, as you say, things that have moved on. But I don't know if the panel wants to comment on that at all. As a savior. <laughs> X is terrible. Yeah. And it's the only option we have. Uh, it's just like what they say about if you don't like democracy, go find me a better one or whatever. Um, X is all the things you said. It's toxic and it's it's, it's you know, rapid transit of misinformation and it... It's it's just destroyed you know our teenagers and between that and, and you know, all say all the things but it is also the single easiest way we have of communicating with you, with each other uh, and there uh, until we have a replacement we're all I tried I I gave up X it lasted like a month and then I realized I I tried a couple of different options and I, I get my information but this goes back to critical thinking. Uh, if you are data literate and you are information literate and you have the ability to critically think about the things that you're seeing, then how is it any different from the town hall, the, the in-person town hall where you've got some jerk in the corner screaming and raising his, you know, you know shaking his fist? Okay. It, it's not, for me, it's not a whole lot different. And you either listen to him or you critically think about what he's saying uh, and then you move on or you don't. I, it's, to me, it's sort of same, same. Um, there's a hand in the middle of the room here, the, the chap with glasses. Uh, I'll maybe take two questions at once. There's a lady over here as well. So, um. Thank you. I'm, my, my name is Jeremy. I'm a former Financial Times journalist. Um, one of the things that's really striking is the disconnect between um, what's going on with, for example, the, the business leaders around the world who are very concerned about geopolitics the latest McKinsey survey of those folks, 67% said the geopolitical instability was the thing that kept them awake at night most. But here in Scotland, if you asked folks in Princess Street what they're worried about, it's probably the cost of living. It's the NHS, all these big issues. There's a massive disconnect here. How do we fix that? How do we raise the consciousness of what's going on in the world and geopolitics? here in Scotland, because I think you alluded to it, Peter, in terms of we're not very good at this in Scotland. It needs to be fixed, it seems to me, because people, folks need to be aware, and because it's, it's the world we live in. Okay, and there was a lady um, just at the end of this. Yeah, yep. Um, could you use the microphone? Yeah, so everybody can hear you. Thank you. Anyway, um, hello, my name's Eileen Penman, and I'm not an academic or anything fancy. I'm just a citizen. Um, but what I would like to know is how do we encourage critical thinking um, within the morass and the toxicity of the web, the dark web, social media, the sun, the Daily Mail? How do we do that? I'm out of touch with schools these days because my children and grandchildren are past that age. Um, so I don't know what happens in schools and it would be good to know if critical thinking, for example, is embedded in the curriculum. I don't mean in a dictatorial kind of sense, but 
so that young people are encouraged to think for themselves. How do we do that? So I'll, I'll take those two questions and then come, come back. Um, as, as someone who studied psychology as part of their degree in the 1980s, I always go back to that Maslow hierarchy of needs. And uh, you, you can't get people to think higher if they're worried about the very basics of life and putting food on the table and heat and everything. So, um, so the way to do it is, you know, aspirational politics to move people out of those lower levels of need. But I'll go to Peter. First. Well, uh, I mean, those are both very, very important questions, issues that have been raised. I sometimes think that, uh, you know, what we call petrol prices here, but in North America called gas prices, are so fundamentally important in determining what people think about their, 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 their economic well-being, but also the state of the economy, because they drive by gas stations every single day and when prices are high and it's expensive for them to move around they get pissed off and it's just one of these local dis disconnects but the fact that there's a world energy crisis when say a decade ago the world was awash with cheap energy and you know the price of a liter of petrol was uh what 99 pence at one point you know uh it's it's world politics and the instability in the global order and the fragility of the global order, which has contributed to this, and which is also, of course, a worry, as you've said, Jeremy. Such a, such a sense of concern for, for, you know, global business. And as far as critical thinking is concerned, I mean, for me, I'm first and foremost an educator. And I see my chief role... In, in my career is to instill year, you know, generations of students with the ability and the confidence to think critically about the world, not to agree with me, but to actually question and, and, and then to look to evidence and to use evidence to question in a sophisticated way. And it worries me, especially when I hear, they happen to all be Tories at the minute saying, you know, liberal arts degrees are a waste of time. They couldn't be more important now than they ever were because of this problem we have about an, a kind of reluctance or disregard for evidence. Because if people look to evidence, they would be able to see, well, you know, you know now that most people who are dying of COVID are vaccinated, it's because most people are vaccinated. And... Uh, that's only natural. And that's the, using evidence to be critical to engage with the information available to us. And it couldn't be more important. And I guess it's a plug for the arts. I'm an historian at a university. I would say this. But it, for me, it's, it's, it's more important than ever that the ability to be able to use evidence and critically engage with it and make an argument is more important than ever for young people, and I hope that uh, we shun these this drive towards more and more emphasis on investment in science degrees, and ignore and let let the, the liberal arts. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, have you seen a difference in the students that are coming before you, and I, how do you address the issue of critical thinking? Um, I was just going to sorry address Jeremy quickly first, sure. and then Leah. Yeah, yeah. um, so I think part of the problem, I mean, I think in Australia it would be the same. The average person doesn't think about anything else, but they're, they're like, I mean, so I don't think Scotland's unique at all. Um, I, I think if people feel disenfranchised, and I don't mean formally, if they can vote or not, but if they don't feel that their, that their input is actually going to have any meaningful impact, then of course they're not going to be part of the global. The global is not them. The global is the McKinsey's. They're not working at McKinsey. So people need to actually feel that their perspectives and opinions count. And we see that increasingly there is massive disenchantment with politics. So we, I, I, unless we actually have a system whereby we can feed in opinions, um, 
And I think that has to start the local. So ironically, I think we need to have a reinvigorated local because then people will actually be able to eventually dream about the global. But unless they feel empowered at the local level, and that's where we have to start, then I don't think it makes sense that they don't want to be part of, of the global politics. So um, being part of communities, you know, making decisions about, you know, how the resources in your community are, are, are used, you know, making those spending decisions, um, maybe even curriculum decisions. This is, this is how we would build it. But right now people are, you know, often, you know, um, worried about the day-to-day day or you know consuming their social media in their little silo and so the global well it does affect them indirectly but on a day-to-day -day basis it doesn't and they have no say in it so we have to have some other way of, of um, bringing their voices in at, at, at the first step through the local um, so that's why we have I think the, the rise of all of this nationalist politics anti-immigration all of that because people fundamentally don't feel enfranchised in, in their communities a lot of the time. Um, in terms of critical thinking, it takes time. Like, it, it's harder to teach. So I think part of the challenge is to invest the resources in it. It's far easier just to have, you know, large lectures or, you know, even MOOCs, which are mass online courses, um, and, you know, multiple choice, all of this stuff. Um, than it is to engage, to be able to hear students, to, to grapple with problems with them, to sort of struggle through it. And that is quite a luxury. I, I mean, I, I think everyone has the ability to, to think critically, but if I think about my own education, like, it was a privilege. And it, it was years, and it was a massive investment. So I think it, it is incumbent upon us as a society to say, this matters, yeah? We're going to spend X amount of money on whatever, but that actually, unless we have critical thinkers, we won't really have a very rich tomorrow. So, you know, how much are we spending per student compared to a few decades ago, or, or what are our priorities here? I, I don't think that actually critical thinking is sufficiently valued, whether it's in the sciences or not. I mean, we have, you know, science and technology studies, hugely critical vein of sort of humanities inflected the study of science, which basically sort of takes um, a reflexive critical angle, even on science as neutral knowledge. It sort of suggests it's not neutral. So, so whether it's the sciences or the non-sciences, I think we need to, to invest in that. And I, I think because there's so much skepticism around expertise that the danger is that we'll have less and less resource into what we need, as Peter said, more than, more than ever. Um, but yeah, critical thinking is about I think actually being prepared to make mistakes in your thinking and to encourage students to be comfortable in that, that there is no right, you know, and giving them that safe space and really muddling through it and reading a text together and, and seeing how different people respond to it. Um, because even those classic texts, people can read in, in different ways and you get always fresh responses because, and just knowing that teachers and might make, we can also learn from our students, like that, that, that assignment I set for my students, my goodness, I learned so much for myself. I think I probably learned more than they did. <laughs> so, yeah, but as I said, like, this requires serious time and money. Jason? Uh, so Peter said something uh, that I think it illuminates the point that Jeremy raised. Uh, you said a liter of petrol costs 99 pence. I know what every one of those words mean. I have no idea what that, what that sentence is. And it's not because I, I obviously know exactly what it means, but so take a global problem like energy and energy supply, and that's a global problem, but it translates at a local level. So you, what you said would make zero sense to 80% of Americans because they don't know what petrol is, they don't know what a liter is, and what's pence? Like, the, so, so, so I actually disagree. Uh, I travel a lot, um, and I am consistently impressed with how how well Scots understand their role in the world. Uh, I think it's actually exemplary. Uh, Americans are idiots, sorry. Um, it, we're idiots just because it's just too big of a place and, and everything comes back to the kitchen table. Um, I, think, I think Scotland is, a, is an exemplar of uh, understanding uh, one's role sort of in the global order. You'd expect that from, you know, uh, from a country like Scotland, who has has led intellectually for centuries, um, but I think it's incredibly hard for the average person to think about a global problem 
because it it's a conversation they're having at a local level and and uh, it's hard for me to think about uh, somebody in Edinburgh having trouble w with you know gas prices when I, it's my problem I, I I have that problem at home and I don't know what the solution is and I don't think about energy crisis and I don't think about alternative energies uh, I that's what I elect people to do I elect people to, to think about that problem and to fix my problem, make, you know, make my gas cheaper, make my petrol cheaper, uh, so I pay fewer pence. I don't know what any of those words are. Um, so, so, but I, 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 think, I think people in Scotland are, are much more uh, aware of this global sense of being than uh, many places. I suppose it's worth pointing out that Craig Cullen for Excellence has been with us for quite some time and two of the underpinnings of that are critical thinking and responsible citizens. Um, I'll make no comment about how successful that has been, though, but it does underpin the curriculum at the moment in Scotland. Um, so we've got a few more hands. This gentleman said his hand up for some time, and I, th I think the, the man over here in the glasses as well will go, and hopefully we can get another couple in at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Titus Alexander, I wrote a book some years ago on the parallels between apartheid and the global order called Unraveling Global Apartheid. And in a, way, in a way, it's now coming much more to the fore because one of the roots of apartheid was nationalist populism from the people who were worst affected by globalization at the time. And we're seeing that now in an intensive, we see that at the borders and the way in which fences are going up. So I was particularly depressed when you said the global law is eroding because in a way developing global laws and norms that are equal for the global south and the global north is what's most important. There are a few straws in the wind in the International Criminal Court, which of Scott was one of the driving forces of Robin Cook, and uh, also the um, initiative from Brazil to have t global taxation on billionaires. And there's also one, the OECD, having a flat a minimum rate of global corporate tax. So I'm just wondering what you think ordinary citizens can do to support a transition from a grossly unequal global order to one where we have global law and economic norms that are more equitable for the global south. Thank you. And I'll take the other question as well from the gentleman in the glasses. Thanks. I'd like to follow up a bit about the critical thinking issue. The discussion has been about how we teach critical thinking, and that focuses on somewhere between 10-year-olds to 20-year-olds. The problem isn't with 10-year-olds and 20-year-olds that critical thinking is lacking today. The problem is with 40-year-olds and 80-year-olds and 70-year-olds. Teaching young children and middle age, middle children and university students to think critically is great, but that's not the issue. What do we do with the lack of critical thinking that my generation and generations down to 20-year-olds have experienced? I'll put a twist on that also. I think that emotions play a much more important role in how people judge politics. And emotions include things like anger, and emotions include things like compassion. And these need also to be brought forward. Thank you. So, two very challenging questions. <laughs> um, Michelle, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, well, with apartheid, um, the term is uh, obviously was grounded in, in the Afrikaans word and was thought of specifically in terms of Southern Africa. And there's, a, there's obviously a lot of knowledge around that. Um, and what I find fascinating is uh, I've worked on Palestine myself, so the way that word has then been taken up in the last few decades, not talking a few years, but decades, in the Palestinian struggle, um, and there are a lot of links between Palestine and, and South Africa, but that it is actually now being used more broadly. So in the last, let's say, two, three years, it's now being used um, as a term in relation to gender. So gender apartheid is now is sort of being debated as whether or not that should actually be um, a formal prohibition under international law and their efforts um, to regulate that. And I think in terms of our own discussion here, 
Um, I think apartheid around climate justice would also be one way of thinking about radical inequalities um, as well, based potentially on race, but I think more so in terms of nationality or access to particular jurisdictions. So um, I, I think that, yeah, I think apartheid potentially is, is a sort of useful way of shedding light or being critical about particularly unequal um, and abhorrent uh, practices. Um, it was actually obliquely referred to even by the International Court of Justice only last month in its decision in relation to Israel's occupation of, of the Palestinian territories, where it was basically hinting at that there is now a regime of, of, of apartheid there. So, um, so I think that is a good example where actually there is a power still of normative sort of censure or sanction and that these, these, these ideas can still have purchase and that, in fact, they can then be sort of transposed to other settings um, and, and that they can be used in quite powerful ways to galvanise people. You know, if you say something like, that's apartheid, you know, and it's, used, it's been used in relation, for example, to the treatment of women in, Af Af in Afghanistan or in Iran, that is a way of rallying people. Um, I think the danger is, with all of these norms, this comes back to whether or not international law is useful, <laughs> If, if we have a situation where we have such strong condemnation around something like apartheid that then continues, at what point do people become um, questioning of the system itself? As in, to what, when does the system itself um, lose its legitimacy? So for, for South Africa, the, the struggle went on for decades. And in fact, it, we can say largely it was successful, um, at least formally so. Um, and I think the question for international law is the same. You know, we have condemnation of X, Y, Z offence in various theatres. Um, but if we see over decades institutions failing to act on the strong censure around supposedly, you know, agreed upon norms such as apartheid, that's, I think, where we potentially actually have a system failure. And so that's what I've understood to be the case with Gaza, because I do see it as a test case for for the system. We're, we're too, perhaps too soon yet to see whether it's actually at that point, but, but I think something like the South African struggle with apartheid was that as well. It's a real sort of mirror to us as, as societies everywhere. And unless we actually can treat everyone with respect, you know, what we know what sort of system are we part of so so I, I, I and I think I think these efforts around the creative use of apartheid could be could be very positive but they could also be negative because it might just be thrown around and then oh gender apartheid and then nothing changes so um, I, I don't know if, if I have a clear response there and in terms of inequality I think absolutely and I think we could definitely invoke the word apartheid there as well I'm just really skeptical as to whether or not we're actually going to be able to have firm um, agreements um, and whether we'll just have some countries um, being able to sort of <laughs> write themselves out of it. We, we would need really robust um, guarantees that everyone was part of it. And, and as we've seen, even with something like the Security Council, um, that is, is quite a struggle. So I think we need to sort of make really strong, compelling arguments as to why inequality is bad for everyone, and it is bad for everyone. It really is, <laughs> on so, even just on so many measures. Um, we've got the wonderful work of uh, Piketty, for example, who's done so much work trying to detail this. But uh, I don't think that's filtered down enough. I think people still are at the point where they just think, oh, well, you know, inequality is probably bad for the worse off. It's actually bad for the better off as well. It, it, um, so I think we need to have more of those discussions. Sorry, I've gone on for too long. So, uh, that's OK. We'll come back to the, the, the other issue of, of um, perhaps after we've addressed the first question. So, um, yes, Jason, oh, please. I actually wanted to, to respond to that question. Um, uh, what, so there were two pieces to that. Uh, the first part, what do we do about, uh, well, we, we're talking about teaching data literacy and critical thinking to, to kids because the rest of us are broken uh, and probably irreparably so. But if there is a solution to that, you know, the old dog, new tricks, all that, it is this point you make about emotion. Uh, and, I, and I think the U.S. is an interesting case, uh, test case. Um, we're coming out of a global pandemic and an economic recession as a result of that pandemic, and we're seeing some real ugliness uh, in a lot of different places. And, it's, and so the emotion is anger and fear and frustration, 
Um, and I've been heartened. Uh, I don't know if it's going to work out or not, but I'm, I'm heartened by the tenor and tone of the Democratic National Convention and the campaign that Kamala Harris has been um, endeavoring, which is uh, full of joy. Uh, it, it's almost the, the it, it, and I, I feel like for me personally, um, it's a breath of fresh air, and I'm just sick of being of being sick. I'm sick of being angry, and I'm sick of being frustrated. And I maybe you know maybe a maybe a part of me thinks that I'm being spoken to like a child. Like just be happy. But how hard is it to be happy? And and why do we have to teach respect? Why can't we just be nice to each other? Um, and it'll be interesting to see at a at a political level, at, you know, at a, in a national election whether the antidote to fear and hate and everything that Donald Trump represents is, is it a policy antidote or is it actually just like be nice to each other and be happy and joyful? And I, I, I'm very curious to see if for those of us who are broken in terms of uh, our ability to think critically because we're just too old to change, is it that emotional switch that might actually make the difference? You can't teach us how to think critically but if we think positively and joyfully, maybe we'll do the right thing. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll let you know in 56 days whether that works out. But, but I, you know, it doesn't cost me anything to be optimistic. So that's what I'm going to go with. Peter. Uh, you know, those were excellent interventions. And I suppose I would just focus, like I'm always inclined to do, on generations. And we have to start somewhere, and starting with young people is by far the best way to start. And I, I will defend that till my last breath. And in that vein, I mean, my generation, I'm Generation X, and before me is the, are, are the baby boomers. And these two generations, the formative moment for me was the end of the Cold War, the fall of the wall, you know, and Jesus Jones, for those of you who are remember, old enough to remember that band. Right here, right And now. what we've done <laughs> since depresses me so much. And I think we've let down the next generations that follow so badly, you know, from the, the kind of local national where we, you know, uh, retiring on these, you know, really attractive pensions early, leaving the younger generations to pay them and, and uh, voted for Brexit to make it more difficult. You know, it's hard for them to get a house. This is not a legacy to leave young people. And we have to listen to them. You know, a few, the young people are focused mainly in the back. And some of them had their hands up, and we've ignored them. And that's a shame. Yeah, I mean, we really need to let them be part of the conversation instead of focusing on my generation. There's one there, in fact. Now, I, on, on that note, I'm going to take two very, very quick questions. This gentleman here so his hand up. I know you have as well. Can we make the very small questions? Any of the young people want to ask something? Back, yeah. Yep, yep. Can we go back to the, the young people there? And I think what we'll do is, is we'll take the questions and then I'll ask final remarks and if you could answer the questions. Uh, good morning. My name is Conor McLeod and I'm a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Uh, I'd like to give a question also give a short statement about the island of Cyprus. Uh, we've all heard about the situation in Ukraine. We've all heard about the situation in Israel. If I asked a normal person about the situation in Cyprus, they'd only say, oh, the holiday country. But they wouldn't actually know the actual situation. For 50 years, the island of Cyprus, just last month, has commemorated 50 years of an illegal occupation by Turkish forces. 36.2% of the island is on occupation. And it's still the only occupa uh, sorry, divided country in the whole of Europe. Now, last night I had a discussion with a youth politician in Cyprus called Christos Pamakis, who's a very good friend of mine. Christos is a Greek Cypriot who believes that there should be a united Cyprus as a united state of Cyprus. Uh, many Greek Cypriots and, of course, Turkish Cypriots also agree with this thing, mainly particularly young people as well. Um, now, I strongly agree with all of his statements that he's done and I've discussed with him. But the UN in 2015 to 2017 had a discussion in Switzerland about the reunification of Cyprus. Their talks were halted and it was a failure. Now, recently, there's now going to be discussions with the new kind of idea of reunification with the country of Cyprus. And it really has to happen because 50 years is too long of division. We've seen it in East Germany, West Germany, and we need to actually have a reunification of the Greek and Turkish Cypriot people. So my question is to the panel, when can we see a united state of Cyprus, because 50 years is too long to wait. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions for the young people at the back? No. I'm being pejorative here when I say young people. <laughs> no. I can't really see that far right. yet. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to circle back to the uh, AI thing for a second, if that's right, but in a slightly different context. Uh, more AI art and how like it's actually embedded much deeper than you would think. Like if you were to Google Beethoven, right, the first image that pops up is an AI portrait. If you were to Google horses, the first ten, three of them are AI and you wouldn't be able to tell. And I just wanted to say that it's actually taking jobs right now. Like the what AI art mainly AI art sorry does is that it takes other art it finds online and it repurposes it and it reuses it. And I'm just wondering if you have any anything to say on that, like mm -hmm. any ideas to stop it. Um, have you got two tiny? Qu I'm really sorry. <laughs> I did promise I would come back to you, so we'll take two tiny questions from the front here. I'm promised, <laughs> and then we'll go to summing up. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Darren. I'm from an open source intelligence group. Um, it's probably circling back to a really quick conclusion question. Um, 1990s, end of the Cold War, we transitioned to this uni unipolar world, sort of, as, as Putin would say, the collective West, you know, everyone in charge. The, the British Army has seen a remarkable degradation in its forces. Uh, the Bundeswehr in Germany has seen the same. To what extent do you think we've become too complacent and too comfortable with our current way of living? We see now in, in Poland, in the Baltics, in Ukraine, countries putting their economy back on the war footing. And for this new Cold War, to what extent have we become too comfortable and what's any possible solution? Thanks. Okay, and um, gentlemen here, final, final point, and hopefully we'll be able to, to link some of it. Uh, the panel, <laughs> and maybe the room will be pleased to know this isn't really a question, it's just a kind of maybe a bit of information. I work um, with the International Development Education Association in Scotland. And that's a network of teachers, concerned teachers right across the country, um, who teach global citizenship, which includes nearly all the issues we've talked about this morning. Climate justice, disinformation, community cohesion, etc., etc. That was funded for many years by the Labour government when it came in in 97, and it's a sort of enlightened international development spending policies, and by Europe. Uh, that is a shoestring operation in Scotland now. About 10% of teachers have done it over the last 20 or 30 years. It's about time. It's the centrepiece of the Scottish government's thinking on uh, international, or international uh, relations. It says, we want to be a good global citizen. So there are many, many teachers in all your communities so try and find them and support them and help young people and older people to get to grips with these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Well, lots of points, lots of points. Peter, you called me out. I'm sorry I missed the hands at the back of the room, but please, you go first. Well, I, I think I, I won't address all of them. I'll just address Cyprus. Because here we're dealing with the legacy of empire. And those problems are continue to be uh, con continue to to uh, endure across the world. I actually had a PhD student who worked on this question, so I am aware of it. Uh, I don't have a ready-made solution, and I'm not optimistic that it will be settled soon, because of course the principle of self-determination is a tricky one, and in Cyprus it's been particularly tricky because does it mean that the will of the majority, and what does it mean for minorities, and uh, you know uh, the, the the legacy of the Ottoman Empire is what's happening in 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 Turk in Cyprus at the minute, and uh, to understand the problem, you went back fifty years. I would go back a lot further and uh, say that I'm not hopeful in the short term, but I'm hopeful, more hopeful in the long term that the pe people in Cyprus will come to a modus vivendi where I hope it won't turn out the way it is in Israel at the moment where uh, we are further away from some kind of solution for a state for Palestinians than we were in 1993. It's very depressing. But thank you for raising it. 
Can Do I take some? the AI one? Yeah. Thank you yep. for taking Cypress. <laughs> um, it's like, Cypress, what is that? Is that a lemon? No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, I, I don't know that I can speak to AI and art specifically, uh, but it is a question that we are confronted with politically, uh, this idea that AI is going to take jobs. And while it is undeniable that uh, many people's jobs will be displaced by AI's ability to just do things faster and smarter, I, I would hope that the divergence between sort of service jobs or uh, you know, sort of more menial jobs and the sort of creative energy that I think has driven humanity for millennia, I hope we sort that out. Um, but I, I don't think that actually we're losing jobs as a sort of macro because of AI. I actually do a lot of uh, survey research with small businesses uh, who you would think would be on the forefront of being concerned about the loss of jobs. And what we consistently find with small business owners uh, or SMEs here uh, is that they actually anticipate increasing their workforce because of AI, because AI frees them to do a lot of other things and to focus on being more entrepreneurial and more creative. Uh, so I, 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 I mean, I'd like to think that I could sort out an AI piece of art from non. Maybe I'm not that smart, or maybe it doesn't matter. But uh, I do think that uh, AI is actually going to create more jobs and more opportunities. And I think with more opportunity, then more creativity, it becomes a virtuous circle. So uh, I'm optimistic about that. But there will be winners and losers. As there always have been and always Technology. will be. I, I mean, everyone can't win. That's smart to me, Sam. <laughs> So Cyprus, you know, it's a microcosm of a broader thing, which is um, the obsession with the ethnic nation-state model. And and I think we're at the point where are we sort of going to sort of bunk, sort of yeah, sort of hold fast to that or, or do something else. And I think Scotland is an interesting counterpoint to that, in that Scotland and its nationalism is not based on ethnic um, affiliation. And I think maybe with the Cyprus model or struggle, I mean, my best friend who's um, in Australia, she's Cypriot, Greek Cypriot, and lost some family members during the conflict and only got one of the bodies back a few years ago. So it's very real for her still and for the people in Cyprus. But she has no animosity to the average Turk. You know, it's just, you know, we need to get a model where the people in Cyprus can, can be together. And it's the same with Scotland. It's not about, are you ethnically Scottish? You know, I feel as Scottish as anyone else here because I'm, I'm part of the community. And so I think we need to somehow f find a way to um, think of ways beyond the ethnic nation state. And it's so easy for, for us to get to go back to those nationalist politics. And we see all of, all of those vestiges coming out again through, through far right um, movements. But we need to be creative in our counter models and Scotland could be one. And, and if we think about other examples that are similar to Cyprus, I mean, Western Sahara with its occupation, um, obviously Israel, Palestine, even the Chagos Islands that are occupied by the United Kingdom still. So we need to find ways, I think, to try to um, forge those connections and learn from non-ethnic based nation states because other yeah, yeah, if if uh, yeah if we don't want you know to forge a new cyprus on a binational and a bi bi-ethnic let's say model we need a new new forms of pol political community where we can actually speak to each other and scotland could be part of that so just to bring scotland in thank you everyone um to to the um group that we're asking about cyprus um as i said i, I convened the a Constitution Europe Exile Affairs and Culture Committee of the Parliament. So I've got, I'm issuing an open invitation for us to, to get together and discuss some of the issues that are important to the Youth Parliament. And uh, having worked with the Youth Parliament in many occasions, I'm sure that we can um, have a, a, a valued working together going forward. So thank you for that. Can I ask everyone to thank very much our panel, Peter, Jason and Michelle, for um, a fantastic session today. I just finished by reminding everybody there's a survey uh, if you book through Eventbrite if you could give us some feedback on the session and how much you have or have not enjoyed it today and also to remind everyone that the Festival of Politics is on until the 23rd of August and there's lots of other um, interesting discussions including sexism in the workplace 25 years of the Scottish Parliament 
where are the young women? So I see some young women in the, the audience, so maybe that might be of interest to you. But again, thank you so much for um, coming along today, and uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day in the Scottish Parliament.